right. Good evening. Uh, please find your seats. We're going to be in Psalm 50. I'm sorry, Psalm 68 this evening. Psalm 68, a continuation of last week. We're going to finish um, the second half of Psalm 68, the coming of the Lord, part two. So we'll be in verse 19 and uh, make sure you have a prayer prompter and we'll go right into pr prayer and then we'll jump into Psalm 68, verse 19. All right, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the goodness of your grace. We do thank you that you are our strength. You are our help in ages past, our hope in years to come. Thank you so much for your blessings and the burdens that you convert to blessings when we lean upon you. We ask for your blessing this evening and your spirit's power in understanding your word and uh, incorporating it into our hearts and minds. I pray that that blessing for the teens and the children. Uh, help us to draw near you through your word. Help everyone, every individual, to uh, minister the word today, to speak a word in season to him that is weary, to speak a word that can encourage and, and counsel. Uh, bless our time together as we seek your face, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm chapter 68, we covered uh, verses 1 to 18 last week. Remember in verses 1 to 18 of Psalm 68, uh, the, the request was, Lord, rise up, scatter our enemies, command us to praise you. Uh, Lord, work on our behalf, essentially. And God, he, he reviewed all that God had done. God had worked in the past in verses 7 to 18, um, how God's presence, the ark, had moved forward uh, through the conquest, through the capture of Jerusalem, and all by God's power, not by the arm of the flesh. David acknowledged that in verses uh, 17 and 18. So this, this evening we're going to be uh, on our third point, the God who dwells with his people. Not only does he help us in the past, but he helps us in the present because he dwells with us. So let's look at Psalm 68, verses 19 to 23. Uh, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits. All right, how many of you have translations that says uh, with benefits? Some of them don't, right? Okay, because that it's supplied, okay? So he daileth, he loadeth us up, but with what? The King James translator said benefits, whether it's a blessing or a burden, he converts burdens into blessings, and I think that's why they, they, they added or supplied that with, with benefits there. We'll talk about that at the end here. So, uh, blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us up, or loadeth, loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. But God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such an one as goeth on still in his trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. Wow, very graphic words here. Um, what's he saying? Look, God is going to dwell with his people and he's going to bless them. He's going to load them with something. Benefits or burdens. But as it says there in verse 19, he loads us. And then it goes on to say, even the God of our salvation. So there's, there's, there's a song here. Praising God for victory over what's happened in verses 17 and 18. Uh, they've taken the, the city. Um, the picture, I think, is uh, David and his men being able to take Jerusalem or Mount Zion. And the Lord's presence is with them. Uh, they were burdened, but now because of his presence, they've been saved. God acts here in these two, three verses as a deliverer, as a savior, at the end of verse 19 there, God our salvation, he acts as a deliverer, savior, and then he also acts as a destroyer. Um, it, it's possible that, it, that he loadeth us up with benefits, or he loadeth us up, or bears up our burdens. Okay, that, that's one, how one guy translated it. But he's the God of our salvation for sure, as it says there at the end of verse 19. He has the power to deliver us from death at the end of verse 20 there. The Lord, to, unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. He is a deliverer, but he's also a destroyer. And that's what we see here in those graphic images here in verse 21. But God shall wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp. If you can think of the hairy scalp, um, young, strong, battle-hardened men, long hair, not afraid of anything right? They, 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 they are army men, warriors. 
But those are from the other side. These are, these are men that are, that are tough, that are the enemies of God's people. It says there that the hairy scalp, some, some translation says the hairy crowns. It's just a picture of uh, uh, men who trust in their youth and their strength and who are battle-hardened. They think that they can beat anybody, but they can't against God. So that's why it says there that the, even though the enemy may flee, um, the Lord's going to chase them down, whether it goes to the depths of the sea, verse 22, or westward toward Bashan, um, wherever they go, the tops of the mountains, to the depths of the sea, to the east or to the west, God's going to track them down. Okay, They cannot escape from, from his, his power. So what will happen is at the end of verse 23, he's going to take care of those enemies so much so that he can bring his people as well as the enemies back and so that Thy foot, verse 23, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. Graphic imagery of total defeat of your enemy. So much so that even the dogs lick up their blood. Okay, that, that the God who dwells with you will empower you over the worst of enemies. Right? Graphic imagery. But it's because God is present with his people. Not only to, del to deliver in the past with the conquest and with the capture of Jerusalem, but with the final defeat of all the enemies as well. Now look at verse 24. After this victory, there is a procession, right? There, there, there is a victory parade. Verse 24. They have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my King, in the sanctuary. The singers went before the players on instruments followed after. Among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. Bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin. That's, that was the, the youngest of the 12 tribes. You know, kind of like the cute tribe because he's the youngest and the smallest of, of the 12, right? There's little Benjamin with their ruler, the princes of Judah and their council, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. So this, there, there's a procession after the victory where they're bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, into the place that is made for it in Jerusalem. It's, not a, it's a tabernacle. It's not a, a temple just yet until Solomon comes and builds a temple. But here, David has captured Jerusalem. He's arranged for the Ark to be brought to a tent. And uh, this is the procession. It's a, in effect saying, look, everyone, here he is. He's coming. And who, who's leading the band? The choir is leading, Right? The band is bringing up the rear, and there are women with young timbrels singing at this victory parade, this procession. And what do they sing? Verse 26 is what they sing. Bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. Uh, that's one of his names. He is the fountain of Israel. He's the blessing. He's the source of every blessing. So all the tribes are represented here, from those in the south, little Benjamin and Judah, to those in the north, Zebulun and Naphtali. The picture here is the people are united. There is victory under the king because of the presence of God. So, the, you know, this is a fun, uh, grand, grand um, vision of what's happening here. Now let's jump to verse 29, where this is what we're gonna, about to see is, is uh, prophetic, the prophetic future. Thy God hath commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of the bulls, with the calves of the people, till every one submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. So here the universal praise of God is starting to, to, to bubble up and go forth. Let all the kings and all the kingdoms come and praise him. And there's a rebuke too. There's praise. There's an anticipation of this final victory of God. But here, there's a call on God to summon his might, right? Summon his strength, to show his strength on behalf of his people to complete what he has begun. I think this will finally be answered ultimately in the millennium when the, when the temple will be present. 
and when the kings will bring forth their gold and frankincense to the great king, uh, they're going to bring tribute, their, their pieces of silver there at the end of verse, or the middle of verse 30. But uh, not only will be, there be that praise and this anticipation of, of, of uh, victory, ultimate victory, final victory, but there will also be a, a punishing of the warmongers. Uh, verse 30 is a little bit difficult to explain, and I'm going to explain it to you, I think, the best way that I have read it explained here. It seems to be, if you read verse 30, look what it says there, rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of the bulls with the calves of the people, till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter the people that delight in war. So when the millennium starts or is established, let all the warmongering nations... Let all the spearmen, as it says there, the multitude of the bulls, the picture there is bullying countries that, that have um, war as their um, main means of motivation, right? Scatter thou the people that delight in war and let them go back there till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. In other words, until they all bow the knee to the king, the king of kings, the great the true king, uh, the other rulers who lorded over the peaceful uh, nations, they need to come to the point where they acquiesce. They yield to the true king in Jerusalem from the throne. <clears throat> Let's see here. In the end of verse 31, their ancient enemies, Egypt and Ethiopia, they too will stretch out their hands to the true king. They will yield to the king of kings when the, when the, when the ultimate um, millennium kingdom is established. So that, that universal praise, as he, he receives that praise in the tribute, the taxes, or the honor of, of silver and gold. Look at verse 32 there. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing praises unto the Lord, Selah, to him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that, uh, and that a mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, thou art terrible out of thy holy place. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. And the end result is, blessed be God. There is petitioning here. For, for all the nations to praise God, as it says there in verse 32. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing praises unto the Lord. Acknowledge that the God of Israel is the true God. All the kingdoms should acknowledge this. They should pay homage and praise to him. And again, here's this uh, tremendous sense of grandeur and greatness. Okay, one of the, uh, I guess one of the, the, the movie scenes that I can remember is when a king is about to be crowned, Right? You, whether it be in Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or whatever movie that you, you think of when there's a grand crowning, there's a coronation and all the peoples are there and they're going to honor the great king. That's what this is here, right? They're all, every, every kingdom, nation, and, and tongue, they will all bow the knee and honor the great king. And that's, the, it, it, he is the, um, when it describes who rides in the heavens, right? The heaven of heavens, He's the transcendent one. There's none above him. He rides the heaven of heavens. It, it describes him as one with the mighty voice. He's the God of revelation. He speaks, and it's authoritative. No one has a greater voice or authority than him. Um, it goes on to say, he doth send, uh, um, ascribe ye strength, right? He is the omnipotent one. He's all powerful. There is none more powerful than he is. So here, honor him, praise him. That's the end result of seeing God as who he is. But that's not the end. He is strong. We ascribe strength unto him. But he also strengthens his people. The strength of the all-powerful God is channeled down to earth to and through his people. Right? Right? And it comes out of that holy place, as it says there. Um, 
at, at the beginning of verse 35, O God, thou art terrible out of thy holy place. Out of his presence comes this power. The God of Israel, who is all-powerful, gives strength and power unto his people. Right? A God who is transcendent, a God who is a God of revelation, a God who is all-powerful, gives power to his people. And what should be our response? The last three words. Blessed be God. Praise God. Same thing. Blessed be God. Praise God. And so, this, this is a, kind of like a big picture study about the glory of God and how he works in his presence through his people. And at the end, that ultimate final kingdom will come and he will be crowned as king of kings and lord of lords and establish his, his millennial kingdom. But now we come to the, the, the nuts and bolts here. Knowing that, what should that mean to me? Okay, there is a phrase in the New Testament where the Apostle, Apostle Paul says, uh, we all with open face, unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. As we behold Jesus, as we keep him forward and through, through the word and through the spirit, we are changed from glory to glory. We're becoming more and more like him, right? There's an increase in glory. Here, the picture is a procession of people, a parade of people moving forward. The application for you is this, could be for you. Are you marching like a conqueror from glory to glory, from victory to victory through the Christian life? Or are you walking through a funeral dirge with your head down and saddened? Okay, this is a psalm of great expectation. This is a psalm that looked back and said, you worked in the past, you're working in the present, and you will work in the future. This is a song of great hope. That's the way we ought to live. Okay, that's number one. Are you are walking forward as a conqueror or are, you, or are you walking as if it's a funeral dirge or a funeral procession? Number two, if you go back to verse 19, I touched on it when, um, when we started here. It says, blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us. Okay, with benefits is not in the original Hebrew text. It's supplied. So whether he loads us with blessings or burdens, he loads us every day. If you look at that again, who daily, every day, loads us with benefits. Let's think about benefits and let's think about burdens. Because it's supplied there, we have to consider that it could be he loads us with burdens too. But the thing about a Christian in the Christian life is he loads us with burdens that convert into blessing. What do I mean by that? You know, God is the one who gives us the burdens of life, right? Whether you like it or not, right? Peter would write in, in 1 Peter, uh, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. Why do you hum humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God? Because it's the mighty hand of God that opened the way to the burden in your life. You don't like to think that, but here's, here's the caveat in this, right? Sometimes we bring burdens upon ourselves because we're stupid, because <laughs> we do dumb things. We make bad decisions, right? Uh, by our disobedience, by our rebellion, by our sin, by our unbelief, by our lack of love, by our lack, or, or by our lack of kindness, we cause burdens to, to enter into our life. We do that, right? But if we're walking in the will of God and we are walking in the path of his choosing and we have burdens, that's just the human condition. And it's allowed or permitted by God. He is the one who's allowed it or permitted it, right? So what we have to see is the burden... I have to look at the burden as a benefit. We don't like that. I don't like that saying that, but it's true, right? 
Let me give you the New Testament example. The greatest New Testament example of that is the Apostle Paul, right? He's burdened with a thorn in the flesh. It's either a physical condition, eye problem, epilepsy, or some other type of physical condition, or it's a physical person. And he asks God, take it away from me. Take it away from me. Take it away from me. And God says, no. My grace is sufficient for you. Because of the burden, he experienced the sufficiency of God's grace. Because of the weight in your life, right? Because of the heaviness in your life, you got strong. Because of the trial, you got stronger. And the door of your ministry broadened. That's what happened with Paul here, right? He told Paul, essentially, I'm going to give you the grace that you need through this. And Paul essentially learned God answers prayer by taking things away sometimes. And sometimes God answers prayer by adding things to us. That's what he did for Paul, right? What happened was Paul's burden became a benefit. Because what would Paul say right after that? He would say, my strength was made perfect in weakness, right? He was emptied of self, and he was filled with God, and he was strengthened by God. So where's the benefit? You know, we don't like that, like the lady that said, where's the beef years ago? Where's the benefit? I don't see the benefit in this burden. I can't see it. Help me to see the benefit in this burden. But again, if you look back at verse 18, their word is daily, every day. He allows us to live life one day at a time. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with fill in the blank. Benefits, burdens, blessings, whatever it is. We live at a day at a, we live at a, day, at a day at a time. And so to think of all of life's burdens, if it, they came all at once, it would crush us, right? Think of all the challenges that you had in your life that, you know, that you thought there was no way out. Think of all the, uh, the times where you said, I would rather die than live, right? <laughs> but look at you now. You're here. You lived through them all. And you moved from glory to glory, from burden to benefit. That is what's being talked about here. God knows how much we can bear, and he can give us day by day our daily bread, and our daily burden. So he's given, if he's given you a heavy burden, believe that God can turn it into a benefit. Right? Perhaps he wants you to turn it into a benefit to do something special for you. Right? Believe it. He can. And last application here, number three. Um, look at verse... Uh, 20, where am I at? I'm sorry, 34, 34. How strong is God, right? Ask the question to yourself, how strong is God? Is he strong enough to turn a, a burden into a benefit? Absolutely, right? Um, how strong is God? How do we appropriate, how do we receive that strength which verse 35 says he gives that all-powerful strength to his people how do we how do we lay hold of that number one we have to admit that we can't go far in our own strength we can't go as far in our own strength right we have to admit David essentially is, is instructing us here. This is how you get God's strength. You ascribe strength to him. Right? And that's why Paul said, in, though I am weak, yet am I strong. Because God's strength is made perfect in weakness. So admit that there is no strength in me. So ascribe strength to God. Realize he is the God of strength. Um, he is the God that is, that, is, that is transcendent. He rides the heaven of heavens. He's the God who speaks, who reveals himself to you. He's the God who, who can, who can um, 
give you his power, his strength. You know, we, we always think of God as he's loving, he's gracious, he's merciful. But remember that he's also strong, and there's none stronger, right? So ascribe strength unto God. And secondly, ask for that strength. You receive not because you ask not. Ask for that strength. I, I do it all the time. God, I can't do it. I can't change people's hearts, <laughs> right? I, I can't do it. God, you're going to have to do it. In fact, we prayed today with um, uh, Brother Jerry uh, for the salvation of his family, right? He tries, he tries. I said, look, we can't save them. We can sow the seed. We, we, we pray. God's got to open their hearts. And so ask for God's strength. Remember the promise of Isaiah 40, 31? Right? But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So God is already determined. He wants to give you his strength. He's always give, given an example of how he did it. Verse 35 of Psalm 68 here. He'll do it when we request it. So let's ask for his strength. Acknowledge that we need his strength. And lastly, acknowledge that our strength is from God. It, verse 35, the God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. If you need God's strength today, don't look within, right? Don't look at anybody else, but look up. That's your source. Look to God for your strength. If you need strength, look up. Look up because God is the God of strength. He's commanded strength. He'll give you strength if you ask. And don't don't accept any substitutes, right? Whether it be faith in government, faith in a human being, or don't accept the world's substitutes. Remember the truths of this psalm. Continue to pray, spend time with his presence, ascribe strength to God, ask God for his strength, acknowledge that your strength comes from him. It's very humbling but it's also very empowering. Amen? Any questions or comments? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it is, you, you look at it the flip side, right? Gives burdens or bears burdens, but his bearing burdens is a, unloading my burden it's a benefit right so it, it's the, it's the way you look at it's looking at the same problem from the top or the bottom but you got you got it does that does that make sense yeah okay yeah no no it's 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 looking at the same translation from front or back, you know, this side of the door, that side of the door, same door. All right, any, um, any other comments, questions? Thank you, that was good, Anna. All right, well, let me share with you some prayer requests here. Look at your prayer prompter. Um, Timberly Dirksen's uh, sister-in-law, Becky, let's remember to pray for her. Um, she had had uh, the, the COVID, and uh, she was placed on a ventilator. I got updated information here said that uh, her body seems to be accepting the ventilator and slowly improving. She'll probably be on the ventilator for another three to five days. Um, let's just continue to pray that uh, she responds well to the treatment that she's getting. And there's some progress on the prayer request for uh, Susie's sister, in, uh, the, the sister as well as the, the brother-in-law. Okay, let's remember just to pray for that circumstance so that... Uh, there's clear communication between the family and the hospital there about the treatment. And then Charles and Claudia are in Illinois, returning soon. Let's pray for the, the, the SIDS, Angie's friend Norma, and then um, the Bogers are, are back. We got to pray for the closing of their house as well as the SIDS too. Same issue, kind of, closing appraisal issues. So that, that yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Let's pray for 
Darcy's grandson, Riley Fever. The whole family has it or just him? Just him. Okay. Okay. Any other? Yes, Anna? Amen. Amen. Answer to prayer. So that's Andrew's prayer. Uh, yes, Pastor Philippi. Okay, Pastor Philippi is going to be traveling two and a half months meetings in the States. All right, let's uh, also remember to pray for Vacation Bible School. We've got a good enrollment so far. Let's just pray that uh, there be other families that uh, aren't familiar with the ministry. Maybe catch a load of the sign or get an invite to come. And then that we have a, a, a fruitful week of uh, the ministry of the word to our um, Vacation Bible students. All right, if there aren't any other prayer requests, let's go ahead and break up into prayer groups.